brothers from rural Ireland who came to America to pursue the entrepreneur dream. Together, they created a payments company called Stripe in 2010, making it dead simple for small, young companies to accept payments from all over the world. It has since grown into a giant valued at $9.2 billion. Half of all Americans who bought something online in the last year did so without knowing via Stripe. The company now works with customers as big as Lyft, Facebook, and Amazon, processing billions of dollars worth of transactions for a small fee. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Patrick and John Collison, co-founders of Stripe. I've interviewed you both separately many times and I'm so excited to have you here together. So we're gonna start at the beginning. You were born in rural Ireland. What was it like growing up the Brothers Collison. We grew up in the countryside, right? Uh, and so it was like a, a 40 minute drive to, to get to school in the morning. And I, n none of the friends we went to school with lived anywhere close to us. And so kind of when we came, came home from school, we couldn't you know, go and uh, run around and play with them. And so you know, we had to run outside and play with each other. All else there was to do was to, to go and read books. Uh, we, we didn't have the internet, or you know, we, uh, we didn't get the internet until until I was a teenager. And you kind of got used to when you were sort of browsing these websites or whatever, you know, reading about these products or services, uh, you know, having to kind of scrutinize the fine print. Uh, and it'd be like, oh, you know, offer not available in the Republic of Ireland. And so kind of this sense of sort of staring through the glass at this kind of amazing world and internet out there, but sort of not all of those opportunities being available or equally available or whatever, sort of to, again, someone in the middle of the countryside in Ireland. And so, you know, in, in the way that sort of Stripe is so focused, focused on kind of global access and expansion of global opportunity and, and kind of all those things. Um, it, it, this really was not conscious in any way, but sort of now looking back and you know, over the last kind of 20 years of my life, I think in some ways kind of that mindset was instilled by, again, this experience of, of sort of growing up in 1990s Ireland. So how did you discover computers? I think it'd be fair to say we were sort of free range kids. Yes, uh, like in that I, I'm always struck in, in, in the US by, you know, uh, people need even finer grained calendar controls for their kids' lives. You know, it's like half hour increments are not precise enough. Uh, and in our case, our, our parents were pretty busy. They were both entrepreneurs running uh, businesses they had, they had started. Uh, and Patrick and I had a lot of latitude to, to figure out what we were interested in. Uh, and, and go explore that. And so, I mean, you're the one who started with programming, but that was that was very self-directed. That was not the the plan, as it were. Like I mentioned, we read a lot, and so kind of the, the standard routine was um, after school, go to the library uh, and get two books. Walk yourself home. to the library. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Yeah. So I walked to the library. Oh, um, yeah. I, I, get two new books, go home, read the books, go, you know, rinse repeats of the next day. Um, and then at some point, um, I just I happened to get a, a programming book um, and, uh, and just read the book. Uh, so you like, read oh. about programming, oh, totally. you read oh. about computer <laughs> before I, I, you had absolutely one. Absolutely, no, I, I, read about the <laughs> I read about the internet for, for years before we had the internet. I got a programming book um, and uh, uh, read it and, and thought this seemed awesome. Uh, and, uh, and built my first little kind of janky website um, and was very proud of myself. So uh, did you follow Older Brother's lead here? Yeah, I, I similarly got into it when I was a uh, when I was a teenager. And didn't you hack each other's websites or something like that? Did yeah, did that happen, Patrick? <laughs> I, I think it's an important duty of you know the 16-year-old older brother to sort of you know um, help educate the you know slightly younger brother as to you know the the, the potential security downsides to some of the work. And so I, I took that obligation, that duty, very seriously. So you made it to MIT, you made it to Harvard, and in 2009 you both dropped out. How did you make that decision? Um, yeah, Patrick is the... Uh, Safety in numbers, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Patrick is the honor of having dropped out of college twice. Um, but in 2009, we had, we just started in college, we had been building all sorts of side projects and internet businesses and things like this. And I don't think anyone ever, or certainly in our case, you don't set out to start a huge thing, you don't set out to, set out to, to, to build a large company, you set out to solve a problem, right? And there was this huge disconnect between the fact that all these new internet services and businesses were getting started, smartphones had just arrived, it felt like such a land of opportunity. And then when you actually went to do anything on the, on the business side of things and actually accept money for what you'd built, it was like going back to the 70s. And so I think it was honestly helpful that one, you know, we were definitely young when we started out, and two, that we weren't coming from being industry professionals who had been in the industry for 30 years or anything like that. Because you can bring a fresh perspective to it. And, and we started approaching it from the perspective of the people who actually proved to be 
the most important decision maker of all, which is the software developer who's actually building this stuff. The thing that um, uh, I think led to us dropping out was kind of the realization that what we initially conceived of as being sort of a slightly niche product for developers or something solving a narrow problem or, or something like that uh, was actually, you know, this kind of lake was actually an ocean. Uh, and that the character of the problems we were addressing in terms of what is the you know, global economic infrastructure for the internet, and why is it not possible, you know, even then, in 2010, to accept customers, payments, revenue from internet users anywhere in the world. And how did your mom and dad feel about this? I mean, I know they're entrepreneurs. I often wonder, again, were I in their shoes, how would I react? But uh, they, they, they were always uh, sort of, you know, they, they asked us to kind of explain our decisions. They didn't just kind of uh, rubber stamp. Um, but, but then they were always supportive. And I think John and I, you know, are, are hugely lucky to, to, to have parents like that. So you got into Y Combinator. You moved to Buenos Aires to build the company. Walk me through a little bit of the early days of, of building. The early days of building just weren't that glamorous. Uh, it was um, it was myself and John, uh, you know, programming all day, every day. We wanted to get up and running with real customers as soon as possible. And so we accepted the first real payment on Stripe in January of 2010, um, only kind of a couple of weeks after starting to work on it. And, and then the feedback loop was just, okay, what does this business want? Uh, and how will we go implement that? And you know, let's make it happen as quickly as we can. And you know, when we're ready, let's add a second business and so on. You say that no one has to fail in order for Stripe to succeed. What does that mean? I mean, does it mean you don't think you have any real competitors? Well, I think there's a desire to set these things up as a, you know, Stripe versus banks or, or you know, X versus Y whenever, whenever there's a narrative about these things. A very large fraction of the time when people are building businesses on Stripe, they're building businesses in white space as opposed to replacing uh, another business directly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the stat that is very motivating for us is that 5% of global commerce takes place online today. You know, the other 95% is offline. Uh, and so that's what we mean when we say no one has to fail. You've done a lot of partnerships with companies that could be perceived as your competitors, like Apple, like Google, like Visa. Yeah. Walk me through the strategy. We think all of those consumer payment methods will all be really successful over time. But what has always been lacking is a platform for the businesses to just manage and abstract the complexity of doing business online in 2018. When you talk to a business and just what is required, even for table stakes, uh, to get up and running, managing the payments and the treasury and the regulation and the compliance and all the complexity that goes with that, first off, take doing it in the US and then take doing it all around the world, that was a hugely heavy lift beforehand and I think had this really um, damaging effect where only large companies could do it and they couldn't pivot very quickly. And then you look at what internet businesses are doing today, the business models are changing, they're much more global, they're often getting much more complex, like a multi-party interaction or something like that. And so that's what we're focused on and that's why, I mean, Apple Pay has been growing like a weed as a payment method and that's phenomenal for Stripe. On a global basis, the market sizes and the opportunities have never been greater. Stripe's been working with smaller businesses for a long time, but Bloomberg broke the news. You are now working with Amazon. You're working with Facebook, Microsoft, Allianz, Booking.com, Lyft. How does a startup that is growing, but still a startup like Stripe, serve such huge companies? I think our success with, with sort of these larger companies and the, the companies you name, it's not kind of despite the fact that we started working with startups, it is because we started working with startups. In that, you know, when you start out as a startup, and especially when you're serving startups, you can't bamboozle them with like fancy sales materials and like this big marketing campaign or whatever. Like they're just not gonna be deceived by it. They will assess you precisely on the product merits, what helps them innovate fastest and you know, fulfill their ambitions and goals and all the rest as rapidly as possible. And so it's really punishing. And so we were forced to build a product that sort of uh, you know, helped them execute as quickly as possible. So Stripe makes money by charging a small fee on every transaction. You're now processing billions of dollars uh, a year for hundreds of thousands of companies taking payments worldwide. You're 
reportedly valued at $9.2 billion. You've raised $450 million in funding. Some analysts say your valuation isn't justified, and we've certainly seen companies going to the public markets that haven't been able to hit the market cap that they raised at privately. Do you have any concern that you won't be able to hit that mark? I think we're certainly always paranoid that we need to execute strongly to actually meet the potential of Stripe. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking kind of does the potential market size uh, support that kind of valuation? Absolutely, many times over. Because again, the, the internet economy is so vast and so much smaller than it will be if we actually had the good infrastructure to support it. Do you see it. Stripe as a public company? Someday, quite plausibly. Mm -hmm. um, but the way we've always thought about ourselves is that we're in such an expansion phase. We're so far from reaching kind of the, the plateau of that sigmoid when things kind of stabilize and you know the whole business becomes predictable. I mean, I was in Asia um, back last week and man, there's just like such vast opportunity there for, for every internet business, sort of uh, uh, Stripe included, um, that I guess we're just so fixated on making sure, how do we ensure that sort of what Stripe is doing in, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, and so on, that like we're really capitalizing on, on, on the opportunities there. And we'll then, you know, back solve from that to, you know, whatever the right sort of long-term, you know, structure of the company is, yeah, we'll, we'll fit it, you know, within that. Speaking of what's happening more broadly, you know, we're in a world of great political and economic uncertainty with President Trump being elected, with Brexit, with, you know, Facebook and Apple and Google, you know, on the other hand, sort of squelching all of the smaller companies and in a way you could say squelching innovation. Could that hurt Stripe? given that you depend on businesses getting started. When you zoom out and I guess, you know, just take stock of sort of what's happening on a global basis, the number of internet connected just users and, and people in the world continues to rise incredibly quickly. And of course, you know, around the world, middle classes are rising. I mean, 100,000 people are leaving poverty every day, right? And so I think on a global basis, the kind of the market sizes and the opportunities the, uh, sort of presented for you know, people who want to do something new or want to kind of build something significant. I think those opportunities have never been greater. And you know, there's always been concern that the kind of the particular giants of the day are sort of overly dominant and, and kind of might uh, exercise some of this force. And generally speaking, you know, those giants have have only prevailed for sort of a particular window, right? You know, we had this concern about Microsoft in the 90s. We had the concern about IBM before that, and so on, right? And so I think. The, there have always been sort of preeminent technology companies, and I don't see anything kind of distinctly different uh, about the, 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 the current generation. Coming from Ireland, you know, what do you think of Brexit? Is it concerning? I am concerned by the general trend we're seeing in, in, a, in a number of countries around the world towards more inward looking and, and more retrenchment. Uh, in part because I don't think it's the global long-term trend, right? Mm. Uh, it, it has been a mistake historically to bet against more global integration or to assume that people, you know, there will not be more migration of people, there will not be more migration of cultures, there will not be more migration of you know, goods and services and things like that. And I don't think things like Brexit are going to change that fact. You both spent time with President Obama. As the Trump administration takes things in a different direction, slide towards protectionism, you know, what are your biggest concerns? We benefit from such uh, an amazing set of tailwinds, right? Uh, in that th there have never been more people employed in the US uh, at any time in the past. The uh, global inequality is falling. Like, just th th there's so much kind of good that's happening that I think, um, you know, Yet I, I, there I, I, are some I, things that are alarming and no, some bad that is happening, arguably. I, I, absolutely, I, but I, I guess where I was going to go is that so I think when you really zoom out and look at the kind of the full time series here, I think almost all of the major trends are going in the right direction. And so then what concerns me is what are the tail events that could really jolt these off course? It's not clear um, just how much influence uh, a single person in a single country can have against uh, uh, all of these broader trends. But, but, but no, that, that, that is what gives me concern. Our determination was that Bitcoin was not a good payment method. Cryptocurrency is all the rage right now. 
and Stripe initially accepted Bitcoin, but recently stopped. Are you at all concerned that Stripe will be on the wrong side of history with that decision? We're absolutely open to revisiting this. At the time we made that decision, it was trending towards being a digital store of value. I think that's a valuable thing to have exist in the world. You know, I. I genuinely wish them the very best with that, right? It just, it works less well for our use case. And this wasn't just kind of so much like a decision where we wanted to be the arbiter, we we're just looking at the data and like it was declining rapidly in, in use as a payment method. Mm -hmm. If it starts increasing again as a payment method, then sure, great, we'll, we'll, we'll go back and we'll add it. So Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, is it hype? Is it reality? Is it a bubble? Our determination was that Bitcoin was not a good payment method, which is a very different uh, you know, discussion than cryptocurrencies generally. Because the value was shifting so dramatically. Well, and because the, the, the speed and cost of even just posting transactions on, on the Bitcoin network was the main thing. So we remain fascinated by cryptocurrencies from a, from a technology point of view and just the general speed of execution in the space. I see tons of companies and tons of people getting distracted by almost vanity projects of, you know, we'll put this database on the blockchain or things like this, because people are not really wedded in the in the technical details and, and what's necessary. There's a concern that Bitcoin and blockchain pioneers are still mostly young and mostly male. This as the tech industry is grappling with a big diversity problem. If the tech industry doesn't start doing a better job, including people of all backgrounds, what are the consequences? The tech industry has to be a place where people of any background or any demographic or you know whatever origin can really thrive, and there have been some you know big missteps uh, on that front that you know have attracted prominent headlines and and rightly so. People are paying a lot of attention just to, to Silicon Valley and to how it is that we do things here, and there's kind of really real ripple effects around the world. And so I think for myself and John, we really try to start at home, as it were, um, and. You know, if we can't build a company and a culture and an organization that we can really be proud of um, and that we can really feel good about and that, again, where people of any background can really thrive, then I think we, we just we have not achieved anything of value. Stripe, you know, you, you guys have some really interesting things. You have an open floor plan so people change desks every so often and can meet new people, gender neutral bathrooms, um, you have an interesting email transparency policy where everyone can read everybody else's emails, as I understand it. It is, I would say. It's, um, uh, you know, pe people can choose to make certain emails available, but it's, it's very much on an opt-in per email basis, but anyway. Susan Fowler, the former Uber engineer who wrote that viral blog post about Uber, about sexual harassment and discrimination, and ultimately you know, resulted in the CEO leaving the company, she now works at Stripe. What do you see yourselves continuing to do to attract and retain, you know, whether it's women or underrepresented minorities. There's a whole bunch of sort of specific initiatives that we work on, right? There's things around, you know, making sure that people who become, you know, moms and parents, you know, stay with the company and, you know, we're, we track those numbers carefully and we're, you know, delighted they're as high as they are. And there's initiatives we work on for female entrepreneurs and there's kind of specific hiring practices, both in how we interview people and, um, uh, you know, hiring goals, especially in engineering that we set for managers and, and stuff like that. But like, I think sometimes people leap a bit too quickly to kind of what's their checklist of initiatives and then they think they're kind of done. I think that like, if you're actually going to take this seriously, if you're actually going to do it well, uh, I think it has to be something that that is really deeply kind of just like suffused in the culture and that everybody lives every day because, you know, you, you, again, you, you can have a good list of initiatives, but if it's not really in the culture, then you know, it's just not going to work. Now, before we go, I understand there's a third Collison brother who, as I hear, is even more tech savvy than you are. Tell me about Tommy. Yeah, so t Tommy is uh, four years my junior, and Tommy was uh, <clears throat> very interested in this topic that we talk about, about the implications of technology and the fact that more of our lives are moving online. He, he was really interested in that before it was the talk of the town and before it was the cool thing to be into. And, and so we worked at the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a very storied uh, uh, nonprofit around digital rights and digital privacy and things like that. And he now works uh, uh, for a company called, or a nonprofit called Tor, uh, who produce uh, traceless or, or privacy pr preserving software, especially used by journalists and people like that. So yeah, I think he is the, the one to watch really. He's taking a very different tack on this stuff. He was born with cerebral palsy. I'm curious how that impacted your relationship as a trio. So it, it kind of affected the whole family environment. Um, and as, as a kid sort of growing up, um, 
whatever circumstances you grew up in, you just kind of consider normal, right? Um, and for him and for our parents and for us, you know, it was sort of, it was very no-nonsense uh, in that, you know, well, okay, you, you, this, this you know, disadvantage or sort of, uh, you know, unfortunate piece of luck, but that's fine. You just, like, figure out what the game plan is to overcome it and then, you know, work to make that happen. And, you know, he walks and he runs and he swims and he cycles and everything else. And, and again, that took a lot of work. Um, but, uh, but there was no, um, you know, wallowing in self-pity or anything like that. Uh, and as John mentioned earlier, both of our parents were entrepreneurs. And again, kind of similarly there, you know, people sometimes ask us, you know, what inspired us to become entrepreneurs or something like that. And, you know, for us, it was, um, uh, you know, it was just like the normal thing. I just see it as kind of a theme running through our upbringing in general. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of no-nonsense way in which both he and, again, our parents approached it. I mean, uh, I find it kind of inspiring, honestly. Um, and it helps sort of keep in perspective, you know, any of the challenges of, you know, building a fast-growing company or something like that. It's like, you know, seeing the, the work that he's invested, you know, again, now over the course of decades, I mean, it, it keeps all in perspective. So what is your advice for aspiring entrepreneurs or people who may not look like you who want to do what you do? The first thing is, to an increasing extent, you don't have to be here. Yeah. Um, like, and that's very different even versus 10 or 15 years ago. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yeah. And it depends on the kind of company you're building. Like for Stripe, you know, given we're serving other technology companies, there are kind of uh, some pretty significant benefits to being here. But you can almost certainly do it wherever you are today. I would take advantage of the communities, tools, and knowledge the internet now makes available and start where you are right now. How do you see yourselves navigating your partnership, your relationship as brothers, as the company grows and the stakes, if all goes well, right, only get higher? We figured it out. You know, we've survived this long. I'm not too worried about it on a uh, on a go forward basis. But in particular, it's very. Uh, I think after 20 years, you know, we can extrapolate we'll at least survive another couple. Right. Exactly. Who gets the last word, by the way, when well, you disagree? Gosh, I can't remember the last time we even had a discussion about figuring that out. Because when you're so focused on the work, you know, Stripe just passed a thousand people. We're still hiring very quickly. There is always the next problem and the next uh, interaction to go with. And so I think one of the things that I find very enjoyable is when you have a high trust environment, that, which we do, and when you've been working together for a long time, you're sort of not focused on the the meta structure and how do we arrange the Lego bricks and things like that. You're always focused on the on, on the next problem. Where will Stripe be in, let's say, five years? I hope that we have substantially completed this work of building this globally unified economic infrastructure uh, that serves companies of every size and that makes it possible for way more companies to get started and sort of companies that get started no matter what country in the world they're in, I still think it's absolutely freaking crazy that if you start a business in Indonesia, you know, good luck selling to customers in America. And if you start a business in Germany, good luck selling to consumers in China and so on. It's like, we should be up in arms over the fact that the internet does not make this infrastructure available today, that, it, that it's not complete. And I'm very proud of sort of, you know, the progress we've made over the first, you know, six, seven years. But you know we, we've quite a ways left to go. When we're sitting here, uh, I hope in, in in five years, you know, uh, uh, I hope that sort of that foundational infrastructure, you know, has been put in place. And now we're or at, at that point. Then we can be kind of turning our sights to you know what comes after it. All right, I'm scheduling our catch up for five years exactly. from now. Exactly. Set a calendar reminder. <laughs> John and Patrick Carlson, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's really been great to have you.